What's going on everyone? I'm Alex, a doctoral candidate at NUS Business School in Singapore and head of scenario consulting at Shaping Tomorrow. And today I have the pleasure to be talking with Peter Skoblik. Peter is the co-founder and principal of Event Horizon Strategies, a foresight consultancy, a senior fellow with the International Security Program at New America, an instructor in Harvard's professional development program, and a fellow with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Peter received his doctorate degree from Harvard Business School, where his research on uncertainty, strategic foresight, and the long term won the WIS Award for Excellence. Peter has published widely on strategic foresight, including in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Science, and Harvard Business Review. Welcome, Peter, and thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure, Alex. Thank you. I'm so excited to be talking to you today, Peter, because I think you're such an interesting case study. Uh, I think you are the only person I met in my academic career uh, who have was done research in foresight in a top business school in USA, which is quite rare. So I think your story is very fascinating, uh, not just to me, but the futures, to the futures and foresight community in general, uh, because I know that the academic establishment resists research in foresight. So I guess that you might have faced some challenges along the way. So I'm really curious to know more about the challenges that you have faced, if any, and how, to, how you managed to overcome them. Well, I think the, the greatest challenge I faced was um, in finding um, someone who knew anything about foresight. Um, so I was at Harvard Business School, as you said, and when I started floating the idea of researching how people thought about the future, I was met with many quizzical looks. Um, and, you know, I was very fortunate in that I had a supportive advisor and dissertation chair in Amy Edmondson, um, who's known for her work on psychological safety, and she encouraged me to, to pursue this. But um, even when I went and, say, talked with professors in the strategy unit, and I would say, okay, so who thinks about how we formulate strategy for the future? Um, I couldn't find anyone who, who really did. And so it, in some ways, the, the, the greatest challenge was introducing myself to the field. Um, there was no one to sort of shepherd me through the process. How do you, came, uh, you became interested in it in the first place? Was it during your time at Harvard, Harvard Business School? Uh, how do you stumble across the, the field itself? So I, I actually initially became interested in forecasting. Um, I, when I was executive editor of foreign policy, I got to know um, Philip Tetlock at Wharton, um, whose work on forecasting I, you're familiar with. And I became fascinated with the idea that you could develop meaningful probabilistic predictions about you know, complex domains like international politics. And I, I just thought, that, that just blew my mind. I mean, it, it sounded like magic to me. And of course, I, so then I you know, dug into the research and I got to know Phil a little bit and it's, it's not magic, it's science. Um, but that is what I was, was initially interested in. And then when I, when I got to Harvard, I realized that I was actually interested in a, in a slightly different angle on the same question. So where, whereas Phil looks at the uncertainty of the future and asks, you know, in, in Nigerian terms, how much can we convert into risk? So how much can we change uncertainty into risk? I was really interested in saying, well, okay, so you're able to do that with a, a good chunk of uncertainty and that's fantastic. And I'm, but I'm still interested in what's left over and how do we handle that? How do we navigate sort of the, the irreducible uncertainty that remains? And so I, I, I pivoted a little bit and then, um, uh, just happened to spend a week at the Naval War College, actually taking a, a week-long war gaming course uh, that, that they taught. And they spoke about the interwar years when the United States Navy gamed out a variety of possible scenarios, um, you know, conflicts with Japan and how conflict with Japan might play out and how that provided adaptability when World War II came and the United States Navy actually right. did to confront Japan. And that... Uh, that planted the seed um, for this notion that we could learn, actually, from future scenarios. Um, we could create experience, you know, in, in Herman Collins words, we could have Aristotle's experiences that improved adaptability in, in the face of, of novel circumstances. 
Um, and so that's really, that's really how I became interested. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Philip, uh, Philip's work is on forecasting, and that is in the short-term future. And again, I haven't read uh, his books. I know he has written a book called Super Forecasting, am I right? And, and uh, he's concerned about how uh, forecasters can do correct forecasts, uh, according to my limited knowledge. Uh, is it because you saw a limitation in the short-term future uh, forecasting approach so that you want to go beyond that and you wanted to look at the deeper uncertainty or was it more like a theoretical? That's a way of phrasing it, yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, one of the things um, that with, with forecasting and, and, and actually Phil and I recently wrote a, a piece in Foreign Affairs that, that gets at some of this, um, but there's what, what he refers to as a rigor versus relevance trade-off. So in order for a, a question about the future to be resolvable, it has to be rigorous in the sense that it can be answered as a yes or no question. You have to be able to score it as a one or a zero, which means that you, you wind up with these very precisely worded, tightly focused questions that, as you say, are often about the short term. And they're limited in the outcome, right? They must, they must be limited in the outcome because if you think about a forecast, which is just a variable and a scenario, which is a complex system, then it must be certain limit. Otherwise, you cannot answer, right? Right, right. And so while, while sometimes those kinds of questions are the kinds of questions we want answered, sometimes um, they're, they're not. They're very, they're very narrowly focused. And what we're interested in are bigger questions that, as you say, scenarios that include a range of variables. I imagine. What is the potential future of U.S.-China relations, for example? That's not a forecastable question, but it is one that can be addressed through scenarios. Um, and so I, I became, you know, interested in, in how we can ask relevant questions about the future while, you know, not having perhaps the, the rigor in the sense that Phil applies to short-term forecasting questions, but still academically rigorous. So it became interesting scenarios and then you were pursuing your doctorate at, at that moment, am I right? right. So you, you, you started thinking about maybe I, I want to look into this in a deeper manner. But, but at the beginning, you, you said you stumbled upon it in a practitioner fashion, right? So it wasn't by reading books or journal articles, I guess. That's right. So how did you, how did you start to, I mean, that's uh, a lot of work, right? Start this from scratch to dig into the foresight, the more foresight oriented literature. And how did you actually sell it <laughs> uh, to, to the Harvard faculty? That's the thing I'm most curious about. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny because, um, yeah, a lot of this, um, a, a lot of my work wound up being self-taught. And, and when you self-teach things, um, sometimes you, you quote unquote discover things and then you realize that you didn't actually discover them, that other people have had that <laughs> quite some time. It's not creativity, and like, um, I don't understand. I have to say I've, I've, I've invented, you know, I've quote unquote invented quite a few things that have been discovered already. Um, uh, but you're right that I did um, come to it through a, a practitioner lens at first, both you know through through the Naval War College, and then um, through uh, I spent a lot of time with a community in, in Washington D.C. Um, of foresight uh, practitioners at U.S. government agencies, and you know part of my dissertation wound up being about a foresight program at, at the Coast Guard. Um, so I. You know, we wrote about that in the Harvard Business Review. Yes, yes, yes. And and so some of it, um, my introduction to foresight became, you know, I just you, you sort of find a thread in the academic literature, and then you just start pulling on it, you know, through looking at references and and talking to people, and and I, you know, gradually became, you know, more well versed in it. The the question though of how to pitch it at Harvard was was a difficult one because as I alluded to earlier when I told people that I wanted to write and study how you know organizations thought about the future they you know they looked at me just very strangely and they didn't really did they have so did they have um, something to say about that did they have uh, a another theory maybe about uh, short-term forecasting or sense-making, did they retort in some way or they just had no clue about what we were talking about? Uh, you know, there were, 
there were methodological suggestions in the sense of, you know, why don't you go, let's say, hang out in a technology firm and look at how they, you could maybe explore sort of, you know, ground a roadmap, a technology sort of, yeah. And, and, but yeah, but the thinking about the, the suggestions that I got were often methodological, I mean, qualitative and, and you know, um, they weren't, they, I mean, some of them were excellent suggestions, you know, for example, to the extent that I could talk about, well, maybe the, what I'm really most interested in is the long term. Um, you know, I had a professor who recommended studying uh, family firms um, or, you know, sovereign wealth funds, uh, you know, various settings. Um, but in, in terms of reframing the research question, there was some challenge. And, and what, what finally got me over the hump was instead of talking about, you know, how do organizations think about the future, which is a little vague, I started talking about how do you make strategy under uncertainty? And the uncertainty frame, um, and, and, you know, which I conceived of in, in Knightian terms, you know, sort of Frank Knight's risk, uncertainty, and, and profit, that gave me uh, a handhold um, in the, the literature and, and sort of in the history of, of you know, business thought. Um, and that proved enormously useful. And once I, once I started saying, you know, what I'm researching is how to formulate strategy under the uncertainty of the future, particularly the long-term future, everybody sort of started saying, oh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. now we get it. But let me, let me I mean, if I, if I may um, take uh, your role for a moment, I, I imagine you've encountered similar challenges. I'd be curious to hear how, how you overcame them. Oh, that, I mean, that is curious because I have faced very similar challenges. I have, I have to say that as, as you did, I didn't have any supervisor in this. So I had to self teach myself. Although I had a degree in future studies uh, to conduct research on a doctoral level, right? It's another thing. So if nobody in, the, in a faculty is adept at doing foresight research, then they're not going to teach you. They're just going to give you feedback similar to the one you said. So maybe methodological, maybe you, you can study. Uh, to me, to me, they said something along the lines of you go and study the visions of, of uh, entrepreneurs. They are visions about the future, you know. So they had, they had suggestions, but for, for, for sure they weren't uh, in line with what I thought, which w- was more about scenario planning and so, and so on. So I think for me it was similar. And uh, it was also similar that I had to reframe what I was doing. So you, you had to reframe in a way that they understood, right? Which is un- uncertainty, um, management under conditions of uncertainty and so that they could understand it. And in my way, it was, is what was quite similar. At the beginning, I was trying to study the futures of organizations. I was thinking, you know, maybe I should parlay all the stuff I've learned in my master's degree. And now that I am in a doctorate degree in management, I should just study the futures of uh, management, right? That's the first thing I, I, I thought. But then I realized that all social science research is not really about the long-term future. They study, um, we study uh, variables in the present and in the past. We collect data from the past, right? So they could not understand that. And uh, I started to be understood when I flipped my mental model and I started saying, okay, let's study how scenario planning done in organizations can produce some beneficial outcome. So people would understand me because they would just think, oh, scenario planning is an intervention. You know, you're just an experiment, you're doing a field experiment. You see how people react to scenario planning and you measure the outcome of it, which could be a range of outcomes, right? It could be creativity and even market capitalization or organizational learning. So that was my my twist, um, I, fra- I reframe. And I think this reframing is just very, very key because it's not an established field. So we have to reframe in that way. I, I think, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's very smart. And, you know, another one of the challenges that I encountered early on was that when I looked at uh, the studies of scenario planning in, in sort of the top management journals. So not- Very few, right? Very few. <laughs> Yeah, so not not in the the futures literature, but in in the management literature, very few, and they all said different things. So I would find you know a study that you know saying scenario planning lowers overconfidence, and that's a good. Hmm. It, and then I saw another one saying, well, actually, it, it heightens overconfidence. <laughs> 
focus <laughs> people on a particular future and then they, you know, sort of confirmation bias, uh, you know, leads them to, to see signs that that future. Yeah. Wow, this is very interesting. I think this has to do, uh, sorry, sorry, go on, go on. So I basically saw like effect, no effect, negative effect. And it's sort of, you know, what do you do with that? Right. No, this is, this is extremely fascinating to me um, because I'm also interested in the philosophy of science and the development of, of science as a field. And I think this has to do with the fact that since foresight is not really studied, right? We just do it. We don't study how it works. I mean, not yet, not, not systematically. So the theoretical development is very shallow, right? And I mean, we can go back to Kuhn. If you look at the paradigm of science at the beginning, there's almost no paradigm. There is a lot of disputes, right? And uh, a lot of books are written, right? That is the first stage, according to Kuhn, of, of uh, scientific development. No scientific papers in a rigorous manner are written. There are a lot of books. And then slowly there is a consensus that is created and there is normal science. That's what Kuhn said, right? There is a more uh, agreed upon paradigm. And then, of course, that paradigm can be shifted uh, along the way. Now, that has been criticized, but I think in so, it, to some extent it can be applied to to social sciences and maybe you know we are at the very beginning so you see studies arguing for one thing and other studies arguing for the opposite because what are they studying even the construct what they're studying are not clear right there, there are very few instruments measuring say scenario planning yeah i i think and i think there are a number of of, of problems i mean one is that you know scenario planning is not one thing um, it's, you know, different um, practitioners enact it in different ways. And so how to pinpoint it, right? It's very difficult. Create a, you know, an intervention that is replicable across, let's say, multiple studies and, and isn't, you know, different in some way each time, I think, you know, prevents some progress. And I think, you know, without uh, here, I don't mean to single out anybody in, in particular, but to some extent within the, the futures community, um, there's a there's a very strong belief sometimes, al almost a faith sometimes, that thinking about the futures is valuable and that, you know, it's sort of self-evident on its face because um, not thinking about the futures is sort of self-evidently bad. And, and hmm. you know, I understand that, that line of thought. And I mean, I've never encountered a practitioner, whether military, business, NGO, what, whatever, who says, you know, we spend too much time thinking about <laughs> too broadly and expansively about the future. Like, that's not the problem you encounter. The problem you encounter is everybody's focused on the short term for any variety of reasons. And we, we know that that has negative effects. So to some extent, I understand the inclination to say, you know, asking why, you know, considering multiple futures is good is, is, sort of a question that doesn't need to be rigorously addressed scientifically, but I, I but I think it's extremely valuable to do so. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I am, I agree with you. There is a resistance to this uh, just because it is a very practitioners driven field. So it's self evident. It works, but then I might have discussed this in, in another chat. Uh, I also believe this is in some way self sabotaging because it tells the establishment, I don't need to prove anything to you. You just need to, to follow what I'm saying, which I don't want to say it's arrogant because maybe it's a strong word, but it's shy off. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I am inside the discipline. I'm not, I'm not outside and criticizing it from, from outside. So I am, I am able to say what I do wrong. And I have done those mistakes as well. Sometimes I have just tried to argue to established scholars. You know, it, it works. And then they ask, how, how does it work? And, and I say, well, it, it develops capability to think about the future. What is capability? How do you define capability? How do you measure? So I see there is a lack of, of way to talk that we are just talking about two different things. We were just talking past each other, right? So if only my wish is, if only the community of Futures and Foresight was more you know, akin to, to create a dialogue that frames their claim in a more rigorous manner, I don't think that would hurt. And maybe that, that wouldn't even detract from the discipline itself, right? I don't think it would be bad in any way. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, to 
to go back to the you know Cunian point that that you were making, there's a there's a tremendous amount of knowledge it seems to me that remains to be generated when it comes to oh, yeah. light and and how we do it and the effects that it that it can have. And I, I suspect you know not all foresight efforts are created equal, and we would be well served by knowing which are more effective in in what situations and and others. And I, and I also think in the sense of you know, presenting the work or presenting the, the, the importance of the work to, um, you know, the business community or the military. It's- Or it's, government policy analysis, I mean, enormous, enormously used for, in terms of advocacy wise, enormously used. One, I mean, I don't know if you've run into this problem in, in your work, but, but sometimes it, when you tell people to consider multiple futures or scenarios, it, it sounds almost fanciful. Um, you know, we're gonna write, you know, Science what for? Yeah, yeah. What for? Yeah. That, right, right. What What you're really telling me that that's going to have an impact on my business performance, or if you're talking to a military officer, you're, you're trying to convince them of the importance of imagination, and you know, cr you know, considering a range of scenarios that they might encounter. I think it's extremely useful to the extent that we're able to say, you know, this is not, this is not fanciful. This is this is actually backed by rigorous academic research and be able to sort of ah, well, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. And plus, I mean, you are right to say that there is a number of the different scenario planning methods and futures method, and according to context, things change. But to step to take a step back, right? In in a very clinical manner, I would be personally very interested to see uh, whether we have say one thousand scenario planning treatments, right? And they might be different but they're all scenarios say that we agree that in some way they are all scenario planning intervention right and then you see the outcome of it and maybe you measure it you measure the accumulated effect size using some scientific method i mean meta-analysis is one that comes to mind that to me would be super interesting even if there is a variance in the method to see you know the big population i think it's extremely fascinating yeah, I, I spent a lot of time with a, uh, a colleague of mine who was in the PhD program at, at the Kennedy School at Harvard, um, mm. thinking about how to construct uh, a laboratory intervention. So look at this from like a microorganizational behavior standpoint, a psychological standpoint. Can we create an intervention in the laboratory right. that um, has, you know, people consider multiple futures and does that have some sort of, you know, right measurable effect on the way that they think some cognitive effect um exactly even, you know a, a metacognitive effect in the sense of they they change the way that they think how they should think um and the the things that we got hung up on and i mean i'm i'm looking forward to you know other people doing this or continuing work on this myself is you know how do you structure the the independent and the dependent variables so that you're reducing to some extent scenario planning to randomness yeah it does run the risk of course of being reductive and and you know there is you know i think a dash of um in, a, in addition to the science you know there is um art to scenario planning and you know there's perhaps a bit of alchemy that takes place in in the process but i think it would be extraordinarily useful to be able to strip down certain elements and say okay well we know that you know by by doing x we improve y I think the, this has been done in strategy workshop too. This would be doable. I mean, to me, it would be doable in scenarios. I see some commonalities between scenarios method. There is some alchemy, as I say, there is some art, there is an art component, but there are also commonalities. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you uh, were hanging out with another PhD, PhD candidate, I guess, right? That reminds me of another question I wanna ask you. Um, in my program, I was always, I, I, I have always felt like an outlier um, because in my case, I am in a management organization department, right? So people study leadership, organizational behavior, entrepreneurship, those stuff. So how did you feel uh, in the Harvard Business School community and not just with faculties, but also with other people. How were you uh, coming across to them? What was your feeling like in terms of social social situation? Oh, well, I, I mean, and I was I should you know should point out that as you know your 
viewers can probably guess I'm a little older than your average doctoral student too. So I, I, I started <laughs> off you know, as, a, as a bit of an odd duck um, in, in a doctoral program anyway. Well, to add on, on your point, Eric Hissinger started at what, 35, 40? So I think you know. <laughs> Well, there, there is that. There is that. Right, yeah. um, so, you know, I came into the program. I had already had a career or, or two, depending on how you measure, um, before I started. So, it, you know, it was, it was strange. The, you know, my doctoral cohort and, and the other students were all enormously supportive. And I, I feel very fortunate wow. in having had a supportive um, community at HBS. At the same time, um, and I mentioned Amy Edmondson, my advisor, who is extraordinarily... Um, and she has an expertise in what? Sorry if I ask. Uh, psychological Wait. safety. So sort of the, um, uh, the notion that in teams, um, one should feel free to speak up, offer ideas without fear of, you know, that you're risking your reputation um, or, or, uh, or your job. Um, so, for example, she studied, you know, the ability of... of uh, team members to speak up in surgical teams. I um, see. First thing she looked at to reduce- It's methods. voice, right? In organizational behavior terms, it's very voice, similar to voice. voice um, uh, but, you know, particularly in a, in a team context. Okay. Um, and uh, so what I was interested in was, was in some ways very removed um, from what, you know, Amy works on. In some ways, we found that there is, there is overlap. But um, to, to get back to your question, I, I would say that you know, none of the, none of my fellow students was working on anything connected <laughs> to what I was doing. And um, I, I happened to, the, uh, the, the fellow that I, I mentioned at the Kennedy School um, was also a bit mid-career, an Air Force officer um, who was doing his, his PhD, who the Air Force had sent to Harvard to do his, his PhD. And he was just interested by the subject. And so he was sort of, we were working together, you know, almost in his free time to an extent. Wow. It wasn't going to be part of his dis dissertation. It could have been part of mine, I suppose, if, if things had worked out. Um, but finding, um, finding like minds who were- Difficult, yeah. was, was a challenge. People would find the subject very interesting, but it, it just wasn't what they were working on. Same with me. Same with me. Very interesting. Uh, the other side of the globe, right? <laughs> and the yes, same situation. Exactly. Same situation. Exactly. In my case, you know, I also had a tremendous amount of, of support from my advisor. I'm extremely grateful to him. And um, he gave me so much autonomy. So I think that was key because I had to explore it myself. I, nobody could teach it to me. I had to explore it myself. Um, but the thing I found more, more, more interesting is very similar to what you said, when I went to group chat, right, we had, we have these um, informal seminar sessions where everybody's sharing their ideas and the group just gives feedback about how you can improve the research question, you know, how can improve the research design and, and everybody would share a lot with each other. And when, when it came to me, I was talking about my research idea and everybody was fascinated and but they couldn't, they couldn't give me feedback because the research is not there. Right? So uh, each time I had an idea to share, my part always devolved into a conversation about the implication of the future, AI, robots, and whatever, because it would go into that level. Like, we couldn't talk about research. Um, they didn't have that, that mindset. You know, I feel like, I mean, this is, uh, it's funny because I have very similar experiences and there's often this conflation of the technological future with the future. So like, I mean, we're not, just because we're talking about the future of futures. Oh, not, it must be AI, right? It must be a robot conquering human being. <laughs> but I would have this, the same experience, um, I think that, that you did. And, you know, in, in the sense that people would find the idea in general, very interesting and, and sort of, they were very curious to see what came of my research, but they didn't quite know what to do with me. And, you know, I decided not to pursue a, a tenure track job, but if I had, I think I, I would have encountered a serious problem in trying to find a department where they, where they knew what to do with me. You know, a academia has its disciplines and its sub-disciplines and they're defined sometimes quite, quite narrowly. Um, and it's, Boy. it's difficult. Um, there's, I find there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinarity or cross-disciplinarity, but um, 
not, yeah, at the end of the day is very silent. Yeah. We do that. Um, at least not until later in their careers. Um, you know, the idea mm-hmm. establishing they have tenure when they have tenure, that's right. When you have tenure, great. But this is good because I mean, I see this as a contribution, at least now, right? We know that a bunch of people at Harvard Business School are aware about foresight and they are going to have an eye on it. So they know the field exists. At least this is something. And maybe they're going to read some papers about it then. How did you manage with a committee? You, you must have had a committee to, to judge the rigor of your work when you submit to your, your final contribution, right? I did. I had, so my, my dissertation was eclectic and my committee was, was somewhat eclectic. Um, and so the, the dissertation was actually three papers. Um, and one was a history paper um, about Frank Knight and uh, Herman Kahn. Uh, one was a theory paper. Um, and the, the third was this empirical study of the Coast Guard. And so I put together a committee that was um, sort of, I had, I had, you know, Amy as my chair and then uh, Robin Ely, a qualitative researcher. And uh, on a side note, we can find those papers online. Am I right? Because I have read, I I'm, think I'm read them. The theory paper online, it's an HBS working paper. Um, the other two have not been published um, and in any form. Um, I thought you were talking about the Harvard Business Review piece. Uh, so Harvard that is talking about the for- pieces from all of them. I uh, got it. Uh, so you can you can get a sense. I mean, yes, you can. We'll get post a- that in the description down below. All right. Great. Thank you. You can get a sense of the whole dissertation from the HBR piece and save yourself, you know, many tens of thousands of all right. footnotes and citations. Um, uh, and, and so Robin um, uh, provided a, a lot of sort of qualitative and, and methodological um, and, and theoretical support as particularly on the, on the Coast Guard study. Uh, and then I had um, a business historian on my committee, Michael mm-hmm. Friedman, um, and uh, Sophus Reinhardt, who is in uh, a unit at, at HBS that uh, Business so it must be. It must have been aware of Herman Kahn and Rand Corporation, and at least that part, right? Yes, yes. And and um, uh, so so Walter had really was the one who who got me into Frank Knight and his work, and sort of mm. led me to anchor the dissertation in the notion of uncertainty. Um, and and Sophus is, is a, a remarkable thinker, a remarkably versatile thinker, who was able to sort of speak to the broader themes of the dissertation and. and um, in, in some really interesting and, and productive ways. Um, but it was, I, I had to fashion a committee that I expect looked very little like any other doctoral students committee. Wow. No, I'm, I'm just fascinated. And, you know, I am reminded of, uh, I think it was Jim Dato who said uh, to other teachers of Futures and Foresight, don't ask if you want to teach Futures and Foresight to your supervisor. Just start teaching teaching it. Uh, and I think this applies really well to, to doctorate research. I mean, don't ask if you want to do research and it, just do, do it. And people, I mean, someone will follow. I think that's how it works. I mean, I think a, a strange piece of this is that um, following um, that trip to the Naval War College that I mentioned in, I guess it was 2017, the, the Washington Post asked me to write a piece about historical analogy and um counterfactual was that was it that one they were they were interested in a lot of um comparisons that at that point were being made between uh donald trump and richard nixon and the, oh yes i read the piece yes okay. and i the watergate I, I i right and water and i i laid out some very early ideas in in that piece and I mean, it's a newspaper piece, which is, I mean, an academic, I'm a doctoral student. I'm not supposed to be writing for newspapers. So this is like a weird, weird thing. Um, but that, having that article served as a little bit of a way to introduce people to what I was talking about. Like I just, I had oh, some, yeah. to put them down here and I'm wondering how to develop them in a more academically rigorous sense. And that, so it was a, a bit of a toehold um, that enabled me to talk a little bit more productively, I think, about what I wanted to do. Well, I mean, I think... Academics should write uh, newspaper articles. It's extremely useful, at least to make our arguments clear, because sometimes there are so 
complex it just to simplify them in a way that are digestible so no i actually uh like like that piece as as much as the haro business review piece i want to ask you another question peter before our time is up i know you are a man of practice not not just of of research because as you said you came into the doctor degree quite late and before that you were in practice in, in the public sector and 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 also recently you have just launched your uh for set consultancy event horizon strategies right so I, I'm interested. I'm curious to know what is your point of view of doing a PhD uh, late in your career, right? and what is the outcome? What is the benefit of doing a PhD for practice? Because so many practitioners in our field are really looking down on research. They just think it's not necessary. Futures and foresight are very is a very experienced base, uh, and they even argue. Some of them even argue that some kind of background is in the way of thinking creatively about the future. So it's somehow counterproductive so what is your point of view on, on that aspect well i mean i yeah i i i completely disagree that it's it's counterproductive i think it's enormously productive um and, and, and for for a few reasons i mean one i think it you know i mean starting a phd late in life is, is its own its own question it's a challenge yeah it's it's difficult it it you know constitutes a mid-career shift i mean i suppose if one is going to have a midlife crisis, spending it, you know, developing your, your, you know, intellectual capital is not a bad way to do it. It's certainly less destructive than some other things one, one could do. But uh, it's, a, it's a very individual choice. But I think it's, you know, the, the rigor of academia forces one to structure one's ideas. And that is, is very valuable. And I've, I've occasionally been frustrated in, in interacting with the futures and foresight um, communities in the the sort of loose way that we talk about futures and and foresight and, and vagueness there's there's vagueness and I think you know I mean I'm a former journalist as well and I I like the concrete I like the concrete that makes the abstract real that that shows us what we're really talking about um, and I think that's, you know, particularly important to come back to a point we were discussing earlier when you try to bring this kind of work into business or the military or, you know, public policy, all of, you know, fields in which it could have enormous impact, you know, the NGO community for that, for that matter. Um, because you're going to be asked very hard questions. Business people are going to ask you, what is the return on investment? What I'm going to put, you know, X number of people and X, you know, amount of money into an effort like this, what am I going to get out of it? Um, and similarly, you know, you will encounter skepticism that there's any value to this whatsoever. And I think one has to have answers to those questions that go beyond um, kind of abstract discussions about the, the importance of you know, creating our own future and democratizing the future and, and sort of actualizing our potential. No, there's nothing wrong with any of those answers exactly. It's just that it, they, they don't necessarily have the traction with, you know, people that are making policy or doing business or, or what have you that, that would, that enables, you know, the work to be brought into those fields, I think, to the extent that it could be. Now I'm speaking from the United States where we have such a limited foresight capability and you know, people in other countries have had different experiences, but in the United States, I very much feel, um, you know, particularly when it comes to government, that there's an uphill battle to integrate foresight into public policy. Mm. That's, that's starting to maybe change a little bit, but to the extent that there is academic rigor that can be supportive of those efforts, I think it's, enormously enormously useful and so i don't i don't see the contradiction that that many people um that you allude to see oh i cannot agree more uh you're you frame it more like a, a usefulness of the legitimation of it uh, right in some ways in some ways i see i see this uh enormously helpful uh when you talk to people who are not aware of it what it is and in a number of occasion, people ask me in academia, not in practice, in academia, people ask me, convince me is, is useful, right? Convince me. I literally, explicitly, they want me to formulate arguments, right? That, that are going to strike a chart with them. 
And I have to confess that just recently I'm starting to learn how to do it, but I have not been able to do it successfully, especially when you talk to economists, it's extremely difficult. And I think the rigor part, it, it helps a lot. Um, so you've seen it in firsthand, you've seen it firsthand that when you talk in a rigorous manner with say policymakers about the effect of scenario planning, you are well received. I, I would say, you know- Better received. Starting, better received, starting to gain traction um but i think there's a there's there's a long way to go and i think you know this is the importance of, of continued you know rigorous academic research the the more um that there is the 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 more traction that these efforts will will get and you know i you know firmly believe that there are tremendous returns to be reaped from foresight and i i you know one of my sort of at this point kind of stock phrases has become imagination as a woefully undervalued strategic resource. And I think, you know, you know, to some extent when you're talking to people who are very practical results oriented folks, I mean, those are the terms that, that uh, it, it, it's useful to, to speak in. But I think, you know, it's all pulling in the same direction of creating a better future, one that we, you know, want to see. Um, you know, creating, developing, you know, better adaptability, you know, reducing the risk of negative surprise. I mean, all of these are things that, that I think sort of both the, the, you know, the futures committee community that perhaps um, worries about, um, you know, the most, yeah. Or, yeah. You know, a barrier to, to entry. And, and I really see it as, as the opposite that to the, the more that you can explain the subject and why it's, it's it's enhancing it right it's a complementary i think it's a complementary thing i mean i am reminded of your recent piece on foreign affairs where you very explicitly link forecasting with scenario planning and i am reminded of many pieces who are just saying the opposite we shouldn't we shouldn't do forecasting we should do scenario planning but in reality this either or it's detrimental i think many planners are doing forecasting they understand the language right just expand it in a way that is more complete i think it's doesn't have to to detract from the discipline itself i i, I completely agree and and some people i think read the piece who are not and they're, they're like we don't i don't understand what the tension that you're describing is and i i tell them you know i feel like 90 they haven't talked to futures and foresight people <laughs> you know, the foresight you know talks that i attend begin with the disclaimer forecast you know foresight is not forecast it's anathema forecasting for for futures people is anathema it's just you cannot talk it's just it's a taboo like prediction the word prediction you say it you're, you're basically out that's that's right and it, it it just doesn't it doesn't need to be um right. uh, and it, you know, th these are not binaries and, and, you know, thinking and it's, it's sort of ironic because I feel like thinking in, in binaries is, is very antithetical to a futurist mindset. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, the future is not about either or, it's about many possibilities. And I, and I think, you know, when it comes to the approaches we take to thinking about the future, um, we, we can have, have a bigger tent and incorporate more approaches. Oh yeah, and I have to confess, I mean, to be fully honest, uh, this is doable because I can say it's doable. I, when I look at myself a couple of years ago, maybe, maybe more than that, five years ago, when I started and I was into the masters again, foresight, I was thinking in that terms, you know, oh, that's, that's how we should look at the future. Scenarios, forecasts, it's reductive, it's simplified. You become the complex, the complex person. You know, we need to complexify everything. <laughs> Last question. What are you working at the moment? What is uh, keeping you awake at night? Oh, oh well. Uh, what, what keeps me awake at night are what are the scenarios that we're going to be facing or possibly facing? Okay, let's try. Let's try to uh, control for <laughs> the election. Yeah, I can <laughs> that and and right. No, no, exactly. Well, so one of the things I'm uh, I, I've been thinking about is um, better integration of foresight into uh, into the U.S. government, um, and so I'm thinking. Oh, yeah. now, um, I'm there is a federal foresight community of interest. They are doing uh, uh, very, very many, many, many events. Yes, very good stuff. And they were actually those are um, the folks that I alluded to earlier, who I spent uh, spent a lot. Oh, of, okay. A very, it's a wonderful group. Um, and so I'm, you know, trying to look at at 
different agencies within the United States government, different departments where foresight efforts have been successful or established and some that are nascent and, and what have you. And then looking at, at making the case um, uh, sort of more broadly for a foresight capability within mm. the US government, um, because I think right now we are so short-term focused and, and the pandemic hasn't, hasn't helped that. And then more, more broadly, what I'm, what I'm interested in is, you know, and then this gets a bit abstract, but the, the, the greater the degree of uncertainty in the environment, the more the capability to rapidly shift among mental models becomes important, that this cognitive agility becomes important, you know, not simply among, you know, foresight practitioners or those we interact with, but just in the workforce. Um, that you're, you know, in, increasing numbers of workers are going to have to confront uh, uncertainty in their day-to-day -day work, and having the ability to navigate that um, is going to be an increasingly important skill. And perhaps, you know, if you think of it in, in management terms, like the core competency of the future. So, how do you develop that sort of cognitive agility? And I think one of the fascinating things about foresight is that it 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 helps um, it helps do that. It helps. Uh, sort of convey through its practice the very epistemological and ontological assumptions that it makes so that the future is, you know, multiple. Um, cannot do away with uh, the theory in some way. Cannot do away, yeah. Yeah, it, but the good, the interesting thing is that through the practice, you can run people through a scenario planning exercise and they they come away, you don't have to be didactic about it necessarily. People can come away having sort of absorbed it in, intuitively. And Pretty straightforward, yes, absolutely. And then, so I find that fascinating, but I, I think you know the, the idea of cognitive agility as something that is increasingly important for us to cultivate um, as, as a society is, is an idea that I've been thinking about. So this is something you're, you're considering in terms of a more abstract thing this to is, possibly write about abstract in the in the very concrete um uh i'm one of the things i'm thinking about is the future of nuclear danger so i used to work um in nuclear arms control um and i am uh going to be doing an exercise on uh using scenario planning to scope out the future of nuclear dangers and and you know hopefully sort of change the mental models in what is a decades old and occasionally very stale debate about how we handle the danger from nuclear weapons. That's fascinating. Pierre, I thank you for your time. It was immensely insightful. Uh, I enjoyed this a lot. I think you have inspired me a lot and I think you have inspired others, other viewers too, because a lot of people always think that it's very difficult to pursue foresight at a research level and at a post postgraduate level. But you just provide an example that is opposite to that common opinion, right? I think it's more about as long as you can frame it the right way, you can potentially pursue foresight in any academic uh, institution, in any social science department. So um, th thanks for this and uh, take care, my friend. Thank you. It was my pleasure.